questions, Question Ara, the Honorable Leader of the Official Opposition. Mr. Mr. Speaker, for the first time in 60 years, rent is rising faster than salaries. That's according to the Bank of Montreal. After eight years of this Prime Minister, rent has doubled, mortgage payments have doubled, and down payments have, have doubled too. Will the Prime Minister finally watch my documentary? It's an unprecedented, very striking, common sense documentary. And will the Prime Minister come up with a common sense plan to bring down grocery prices and build homes that people can afford and can buy? Uh, Mr. Speaker, it's a shame that the Honourable Member doesn't put as much energy into generating housing policies as he does to generating housing videos. The reality, oh. Mr. Speaker, is when I actually look at the measures he's putting forward, including in the video, they're going to result in fewer homes being constructed than we are already on pace to build. He plans to put the GST back on some home construction. He plans to cut funding for cities who are trying to build more housing, and he plans for Canada to get out of the home building game altogether. Mr. Speaker, Mr. Speaker, we will make the investments necessary to build more homes and not it up the uh, strategy to cut home funding like the Conservatives would. The Honourable Leader of the Official Opposition. Mr. Speaker, he clearly didn't watch my common sense documentary, which is being widely, ac widely acclaimed by all. If he had, he would know the facts. Our common sense plan takes the GST off for apartments that are affordable, below average cost. He wants to take it off just for $10 million penthouses. We want to take the, t the bureaucracy out of the picture so home builders can build. He's got a $4 billion fund that, according to the city of Halifax, is funding more bureaucratic Thanks. gatekeepers. So why won't he watch the documentary, follow the common sense plan to get rid of the taxes and the bureaucracy and build more homes? The Honourable Minister of Housing. Mr. Speaker, it's fascinating. For him, it's about how many people are going to watch his Twitter videos. For me, it's about how many people are going to have a roof over their head. Here, here. The right path forward is going to have Canada make investments in home building, not cuts to home builders. The right investment will reduce taxes on the construction of homes, not put taxes on them. Mr. Speaker, the right path forward will not repeat the mistakes of the past by cutting funding for affordable housing for 30 years, as that honourable member pledges to do. We will make the investments. We will not accept that cuts are the right approach. The Honourable Leader of the Official Opposition. But here's the reality. People don't have roofs over their head. After eight years of this Prime Minister and his housing minister of photo ops and media puff pieces, the rent has doubled. Mortgage payments have doubled, down payments have doubled. In his own home province, in Halifax, they now have 30 homeless encampments. Nine out of ten young people say they will never be able to afford a home. And what have they done? Create a $4 billion housing accelerator that two years later hasn't completed a single solitary house. Why won't they get rid of the bureaucracy and the taxes so that we can bring homes Canadians can afford? The Honourable Minister of Housing. Uh, Mr. Speaker, the irony when I take criticisms about photo ops from that member is shocking because he <laughs> continues to use his opportunities to travel around the country on the government's dime to take pictures in front of projects that our government funded. Oh, the reality oh. is the fund that he is talking about has secured agreements that That's will terrible. change the way that cities are built, not just in Halifax, but in Moncton, Kitchener, Kelowna, Calgary, Vaughan, Brampton, Richmond Hill, London, Whoa. Hamilton, the province of Quebec, Whoa. Whoa. and I will continue the more time he gets. The Honourable Leader of the Official Opposition. You know, all those homes and all those cities that he's talking about, they're all open concept. They have no walls, they have no windows, they have no roofs, they have no basements, no kitchens, no bathrooms. In fact, Mr. Speaker, other than that, they're the best homes you can imagine, and you'll have to imagine them because after eight years, they still don't exist. So. Instead of pouring billions of dollars into local government gatekeepers who block construction, why won't he follow my common sense plan to require cities boost housing construction by 15% a year or lose their money unless they beat the target and get a building bonus? Common sense. The Honourable Minister of Housing. 
Mr. Speaker, the honourable member, uh, honourable member's argument falls apart when you come to understand he ignores the good work that has been done since the national housing strategy was adopted in 2017. There are hundreds of thousands of homes that exist today that have been built or retrofitted as a direct result of government supports that have put them in place. Mr. Speaker, when you actually look at what the honourable member's policy will do, it will raise taxes on middle-class home construction. It will cut funding to cities who desperately need the infrastructure so they can build more homes, and he will remove support for affordable housing altogether, which is a cardinal sin we cannot repeat after a 30-year history where we should have learned those lessons. The Honourable Leader of the Official Opposition. A cardinal sin. It's time for that member to make a confession <laughs> that since 2017, when they brought in this program, housing costs have doubled. The rent has doubled. Mortgage payments have doubled. The needed down payment have all doubled. My common sense plan, which is in a 15-minute documentary he can watch between photo ops while he's being chauffeured around, would ensure that cities have to be, uh, permit 15 percent more homes in order to keep their funding. It would take taxes off construction, including carbon taxes off of building materials, and it would require CMHC bureaucrats quickly approve, approve financing or lose their bonuses and get fired. This is a common sense plan. Why won't he get working to implement it? Yeah. The Honourable Minister of Housing. I'm fond of the Honourable Member's uh, soliloquies on biblical passages, Mr. Speaker, somebody who read scripture in church growing up, and if there's one lesson I took, it's that we all have a responsibility to help the vulnerable members of our community. The reality is we have been investing since 2017 to put money in place that's actually going to support people who do not have a roof over their head, to build more affordable housing after 30 years of Liberal and Conservative governments not taking the issue of housing seriously. The Honourable Member plans to make cuts where we will make investment, and I know which path will put a roof over more of my neighbours heads. The Honourable Member for La Prairie. Mr. Speaker, CBC Radio Canada management at 2 p.m met with the corporation's employees to deliver some very bad news. Things are not going well in the world of media, Mr. Speaker. Over 600 jobs are being cut. That's more or less the same news that Quebec announced at the beginning of November. That means that our culture, our sense of belonging to our regions, and the quality of information will all suffer. So here is my first question. How long had the Heritage Minister been aware that these cuts were coming? The Honourable Canadian Heritage Minister. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I would like to start by saying that my thoughts are with all employees of CBC Radio Canada who are currently meeting with CBC Radio Canada management. We know that there is a significant crisis in the media sector. This is caused by the dominance of digital platforms in ad spaces, and also it's related to production costs. We reversed the Harper government's cuts to media. We reinvested in our public broadcaster, Mr. Speaker, and the Conservatives may want to block Canadians from accessing our public broadcaster, but we will continue to be here for CBC Radio Canada, Mr. Speaker. The Honourable Member for La Prairie. Mr. Speaker, Catherine Tate, CEO of Radio Canada, had her mandate extended by 18 months last June. Her mandate was extended to January 2025. She said that's 18 months to fight disinformation. Well, cutting hundreds of jobs over the next few months means cutting not disinformation, but information. Basically, Ms. Tate is not there to combat disinformation. The government extended her mandate to allow her to move forward to making these cuts. At least, that's the impression we're getting. So, is this what was intended when her mandate was renewed? Seriously. The Honourable Minister. Mr. Speaker. I remind this House that CBC Radio Canada is at arm's length from the government and they manage their internal administration independently. We have always supported media and journalists, CBC Radio Canada and all media around the country. That's why we have developed programs to better support them and that's why we're insisting that web giants pay their fair share here in Canada. That's why last week I was very happy to announce that Google will be contributing $100 million a year indexed to the cost of living. But now we need to do even more to support information and to support our public broadcaster and we will continue to do so, Mr. Speaker. The Honourable Member for Rosemont La Petite Patrie. Well, it doesn't seem like the Liberals are there for Radio Canada. Mr. Speaker, the holiday season is just around the corner and people are wondering what shape they will be there they will be in when they get there. As part of Operation Santa Claus, underprivileged children are not asking for Christmas presents, but for food. 
According to the organizers, it's unprecedented. And that's the extent of the greed and hunger for profits of CEOs who are lining their pockets on the backs of struggling parents. Liberals are doing nothing to curb this greed. Meanwhile, the conservatives prefer to protect the profits of big corporations. In these difficult times, why are the liberals letting families down for the benefit of CEOs? The Honorable Finance Minister. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Thank you for the question. Our government understands that these are difficult times, difficult times for many families in Canada. That is why our government is here. We are here through the Canada Child Benefit, for example. The Canada Child Benefit helps the least well-off families, helps many Canadian children across the country and many families. Now, as for taxes, we created a tax for financial institutions to pay for COVID investments. Mr. Speaker, the holidays are coming up and parents are stressed about covering presents for the kids and managing the costs of a turkey dinner. Meanwhile, Canada's biggest grocery chains are making bucket loads of excess profit. While families struggle this holiday season, the Liberals are offering families a lump of coal. No solutions, just words. But the NDP is getting results. We've summoned the grocery CEOs back to testify on food prices and Sobeys is here today. Will the Minister take this opportunity to put his foot down on unchecked price gouging that's driving up food prices. Here, here. The Honourable Deputy Prime Minister and Minister of Finance. Mr. Speaker, our government understands that this is a challenging time for too many families across the country, and that is why we are there to support families. We're there to support them with the Canada Child Benefit. We're there to support them with a historic investment in early learning and child care. 2.3 million Canadians have been lifted out of poverty thanks to support from our government. And we believe, Mr. Speaker, it is important for the biggest companies to pay their fair share. We think we need to introduce more competition into the grocery sector, and we're doing that with a historic transformation of competition law. The Honourable Member for Calgary Forest Lawn. After eight years of the civil NDP government, they plan on quadrupling their carbon tax scam to crush families, farmers, and First Nations further. This Prime Minister is not worth the cost. He refuses to tell the Senators to stand down and pass Common Sense Conservative Bill C-234 to take the tax off our farmers. Even First Nation communities, more than 100, are fed up and taking this, co this government to court over the carbon tax, saying it's disproportionate and an unfair burden to them. Will, when will the Prime Minister take the carbon tax off families, farmers, First Nations, finally? Here, here, here. The Honourable Parliamentary Secretary. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. And for the fourth or fifth time, I'd like to remind the Conservatives that the only Senators uh, that uh, sit in a caucus sit in their Conservative caucus, and the Senate is, is in fact, in, uh, independent, Mr. Speaker. And, you know, I would actually like to raise the fact that the Conservatives have had this really troubling trend of, of, of bullying, particularly female Senators, whenever they're not getting what they want out of the Senate. And that's a real problem, Mr. Speaker. That's a problem for democracy, and they should reconsider uh, how, they, how they manage their affairs on Twitter and accusing senators of, of not advancing their legislation at their women with, with whimsy. The Honourable Member for Calgary Forest Lawn. This is coming from the guy that swore at a girl in, his, in her DMs. Exactly. After eight yeah. years, the sub hey. NDP government's sure. empty acts of reconciliation are not worth the cost. A recent Auditor General report proved the carbon tax is an unfair burden on Indigenous communities, something that the Chiefs of Ontario reiterated just last week. And you know what, about, Mr. Speaker? So is this Liberal NDP government, because they still plan on quadrupling this carbon tax scam. When will the Prime Minister take the carbon tax off families, farmers, First Nations, finally? Hey! The Honourable Minister of Natural Resources. Price on pollution is an important part of addressing the climate issue in a manner that actually promotes innovation and incentives. But let me read you a couple of things here. I quote, we recognize that the most efficient way to reduce our emissions is to use pricing mechanisms. I quote, we will work with the provinces and territories at both the national and state level to develop a, a, a trade system for greenhouse gases. Those are the Conservative Party platform from 2008 and 2021. My God, it's the height of hypocrisy in this chamber. 
Honourable Member for Foothills. A common sense Conservative Bill 234 will save farmers close to a billion dollars. But this Prime Minister who is demanding his senators block this bill is not worth the cost. The Keelstra farm in Okotoks paid $180,000 in carbon taxes this year. When the Prime Minister quadruples that tax, it will be $480,000 just in carbon taxes. There is no way when 2 million Canadians are relying on food banks that we cannot afford to have affordable, nutritious, Canadian-grown food. Will the Prime Minister finally remove the carbon tax from families, farmers and First Nations? The Honourable Minister of Agriculture. Mr. Speaker, being a farmer, I, fu I fully understand how important it is to take care of the soil and to, and to take care of the environment. Our party has a plan for the environment. My honourable colleague's party does not have a plan for the environment. Quite simply, we were able to make, with our plan, millions of dollars in British Columbia to help farmers innovate, uh, increase their production, and make sure farmers remain on the cutting edge. We have and will continue to do that, Mr. Speaker. The Honourable Member for Foothills. I agree with the Agriculture Minister. Our plan is definitely not to bankrupt farmers and continue to make food unaffordable. <laughs> Canadian farmers are struggling under punishing input costs like the carbon tax. In fact, often the carbon tax costs them more than the natural gas they use. Wow. But the Bill C-234, a common sense Conservative bill, is the solution. But the Prime Minister is blocking his senators from passing this bill in the Senate. Will the Prime Minister follow his 2001 campaign and pass it forward and let this bill pass the Senate and finally take the carbon tax off farmers, families and First Nations? Here, here. The Honourable Minister of Agriculture. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker, and I appreciate my colleague's concern, but I think he's fully aware that the only party in this House that has any control over senators is the Conservative Party of Canada. We do not have senators in our party. And there, there was some talk of harassment in the Senate. We're not involved in harassment. What, we're, what we want to do as a government is make sure we make farmers innovate produce more product and be more profitable. We have and will continue to do that, Mr. Speaker. I just want to say, I mean, the Honourable Member is right here next to me. I can't hear him at all. Uh, the Honourable Member, the Honourable Deputy de Megantic Lerab. The Honourable Member for Megantic Lerab. After eight years of this Prime Minister, people are desperate about their future. There was a survey in the Journal de Montréal, Quebecers, 18 to 45 years old. Well, 75% of them are putting off major life events like having children or buying a house. The Liberals and Bloc voted against our motion, against the motion, which would lower the cost of everything. So will the Prime Minister support C-234? Because it would lower the cost of groceries for all Canadians. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. As our colleagues already said, there is only one party in this House which controls senators, and that's the Conservative Party. But if there was an appetite to bring down prices for Canadians and to ensure more access to uh, food, then they would have supported the Canada-Ukraine Free Trade Agreement. We hope that the Conservative leader will allow mem his members to vote independently, because that will help us support Ukraine and their fight for freedom. The Honourable Member for Mégantic Lerab. Well, the government is trying to turn attention away from what they're doing. Meanwhile, Mr. Speaker, Santa Claus received a list of Quebec's children who just want a good meal for Christmas as their Christmas gifts. There have been eight years of inflationary policies by this government. But the costly Bloc Liberal Coalition just doesn't get it. They don't understand the hopes and dreams of Quebecers. It's costly to vote Bloc. The Bloc Québécois wants to radically increase the carbon tax, which makes everything more expensive. Will the Prime Minister finally put an end to his plans to radically increase the carbon tax on farmers and on families? The Honourable Government House Leader. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I have great respect for my colleague across the way, Mr. Speaker, but I'm confused because he, as a Quebecer, knows full well that Quebec is not part of the federal carbon pricing system. That's why I don't understand why he continues to give Quebecers and Canadians that inaccurate information. 
But the Conservatives, at every possible opportunity, have voted against support to Canadians. So it's nice that now my colleague seems to want to support Canadians, but it's new. The Honourable Member for Lac saint jean Mr. Speaker, asylum seekers are a federal jurisdiction. The federal government must reimburse Quebec for the $460 million in intake costs. And if the minister finds that that's expensive, that in fact demonstrates that Quebec is doing more than its share. Even though our public services and community organizations are overstretched, we in Quebec are finding ways to open new integration classes every week. We're finding ways to help with housing. We're finding ways to provide social services. And the more we find ways to help people, the more the federal government seems unwilling to pay. Will the minister finally thank Quebecers and reimburse them? The Honourable Immigration Minister. I thank all Quebecers and all Canadians who are doing their fair share. The member across the way knows that we have a special agreement with Quebec. With $700 million for Quebec, and that investment is for French language classes and for integration. And I have a meeting with my counterpart on Friday, and I'd be happy to discuss it with my counterpart. The Honourable Member for Lac saint jean Well, Mr. Speaker, for it to be a shared jurisdiction, the Minister would first have to do something, because he's not just refusing to pay. He's refusing to ensure that asylum seekers don't have to wait centuries to receive work permits. He's refusing to ensure that the Refugee Board review claims in a timely manner. Basically, the federal government, government's involvement is this. The government is pushing asylum seekers into insecurity, and what's more, the government penalizes those who help them by offering them services. When will the minister not only reimburse them, but also just do his job, Mr. Speaker? Honourable the Honourable Immigration Minister. I am doing my job. It's a job that's very important and one that I love. Now, there are challenges, for example, Significant migration flows around the world. There are 100 million displaced people around the world, and Canada has record levels too. But over the past few years, we have made progress. We have reduced backlogs and delays. And I think that, yes, there are challenges, but Canada and Quebec can face those challenges. The Honourable Member for Lac saint jean well, Mr. Speaker, Quebec is doing everything and the federal government is doing nothing. That's quite a way to share responsibilities, isn't it? Quebecers welcome half of Canada's asylum seekers and they pay 100% of the bill instead of Canadians. The minister says that he's not an ATM. Well, I have some news for him, Mr. Speaker. Quebecers aren't ATMs either. Quebecers will continue to do their part and then some to welcome asylum seekers. We just don't want to be the only ones doing so. The minister keeps saying that he's going to meet with his Quebec counterpart, I'd like to make a suggestion, Mr. Speaker. I suggest that he bring his checkbook to the meeting. Honorable Minister. The Honorable Minister. When the bloc forms government, they, they can make as many suggestions as they like. But in the meantime, they'll have to rely on the federal government's decisions. It's possible to be a Quebecer and a Canadian at the same time. I'm a proud example of that. We give over $700 billion to Quebec for integration and French language training. So Quebec is doing its fair share. We work very well with Quebec, and I believe that as partners, we can continue to do a great job and succeed. Middlesex. Speaker, after eight years of this NDP Liberal government's punishing policies, Canadians are hungrier than ever. First, Canada's premiers asked for a carve-out. The Prime Minister, well, he said no. Then farmers asked for a carve-out. And the Prime Minister, he said no. Now Ontario's First Nation leaders are asking the federal court to exempt their communities from the federal carbon tax. Canada is unified, and one thing is clear. This Prime Minister is not worth the cost. So will the Prime Minister cut the carbon tax for farmers, families and First Nations finally? The Honourable Parliamentary Secretary to the Minister of Environment and Climate Change. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. And just like everyone in this House, I share the goal of ensuring the success of our Canadian farmers. And that's why our government has exempted gas and diesel for farm use from pollution pricing. We've created a rural top-up for rebates and we've doubled it. We've directly returned the proceeds collected in proportion to the amount collected. We've also returned $120 million to farmers in the last year. In addition to that, half a billion dollars in R&D for new technologies to make sure that grain drying is less and less emitting. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. The Honourable Member, Len Kent Middlesex. It's almost like these Liberals think that farmers haven't had it so good and Canadians haven't had it so good, but they're struggling to put food on their tables and afford food. Far 
Brian, a farmer in my riding, told me he's paid over $16,000 in carbon tax to heat his two chicken barns this year. And the Prime Minister, well, he wants to quadruple the carbon tax. It's really not that difficult to understand. If it costs farmers more to grow food, it costs more to buy food. Clearly, this Prime Minister is not worth the cost. So will the Prime Minister finally remove the carbon tax for farmers, <coughs> families and First Nations? The Honourable Minister of, of Agriculture. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. What farmers and ranchers cannot understand is why her party does not have a plan for the environment. I can tell my honourable colleague that we do have a plan for the environment. We are working with farmers and ranchers, and that's why we're able to make announcements like in Manitoba a couple of weeks ago to announce living labs. This gives an opportunity for scientists, farmers, and industry itself to work together to make sure we keep farmers on the cutting edge. Mr. Speaker, we have and will continue to make sure farmers remain on the cutting edge. The Honourable Member for Louis Saint Laurent. Mr. Speaker, after eight years of this Liberal government, children, Canadian children, are asking not for Tonka trucks for Christmas, but rather for food. That's what Canada is now after eight years of this Liberal government. And food comes from agriculture. Bill C-234 is currently being blocked by senators appointed by this Liberal Prime Minister. And now the Bloc Québécois, which voted for the bill, is supporting senators delaying its passage in the Senate. It's expensive to vote for the Bloc. Will the Prime Minister finally cancel his plan to radically increase the carbon tax on farmers and on families? Will he cancel it once and for all? Honorable uh, Secretary Parliament. The Honorable Parliamentary Secretary. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Well, in fact, Canada, like many countries around the world, is dealing with the impacts of inflation, and Canadians are feeling those impacts. During our time in government, we have taken action to support Canadians, for example, the Canada Child Benefit, which lifted many Canadian children out of poverty, and we continue to take action like that. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Three CEOs raked in billions of profits as they jacked up prices for Canadians just trying to put food on the table. And what did this Prime Minister do? Nothing. And now, Sobeys workers in Halifax are on the streets demanding fair wages so they can afford to buy the food that they sell. Sobeys CEO, who makes $6.8 million a year, has insulted their workers with a five-cent raise per hour, a nickel. So, what is this government doing to tackle the corporate greed that is exploiting workers from coast to coast? Here, here. The Honourable Deputy Prime Minister, Minister of Finance. Mr. Speaker, our government absolutely believes that everyone in Canada needs to pay their fair share. That's why we have permanently increased corporate income tax on financial institutions by 1.5%. That is why we implemented a COVID recovery dividend of 15%. And that is why, Mr. Speaker, we are introducing historic changes to competition law in Canada. These will increase competition, particularly in the grocery sector. That is going to help Canadian families from coast to coast to coast. The Honourable Member for Vancouver East. Canadians with loved ones in Gaza have spent many sleepless nights worrying about their families as the humanitarian crisis worsened. UNICEF now calls Gaza the most dangerous place for children in the world. Today, the NDP joined with a coalition of Palestinian families and community groups to call for special immigration measures so that people in Canada can reunite with their loved ones. The Australian government is already doing it. Canada must do the same. Will the Liberals immediately enact special immigration measures to include extended family members of Canadian citizens and permanent residents in, from Gaza. The Honourable Minister of Foreign Affairs. Mr. Speaker, I agree that Gaza is one of the worst places to live in the world right now, and we're very preoccupied by the fact that many children, too many children, and too many women have lost their lives. I met with many humanitarian groups earlier today to share my concern and to hear their thoughts on how we can make sure that Palestinian civilians are protected. And meanwhile, I must say that we are extremely happy that 130 Canadians were able to cross Rafa last night here, and are here. now back in Egypt heading towards Canada. Thank you. The Honourable Member for Aurora Oak Ridge's Richmond Hill. Mr. Speaker, 
On this 10th day of the 16 days of activism against gender-based violence, it is crucial to highlight the crisis of missing and murdered Indigenous women and girls and 2S LGBTQI plus people is ongoing. And with the magnitude of this national tragedy, we must continue to work together on a comprehensive response to address its root causes and the need for accountability. Can the Honourable Minister of Crown Indigenous Relations shed light on the specific actions that this government is currently undertaking to address the ongoing crisis? Thank you. The Honourable Minister of Crown Indigenous Relations. Mr. Speaker, I would like to thank the member for her hard work and her advocacy. The ongoing national crisis of violence against Indigenous women, girls and 2S LGBTQI plus people must come to an end. Last week, we met with families, survivors and Indigenous leaders to work towards the Red Dress Alert system so that when Indigenous women go missing, they can be found. And today, I announced funding for 31 Indigenous-led projects to implement our action plan. This includes funding to enable the Ontario Native Asso Women's Association to better support families. We are working in partnership right across Canada to address this crisis, Mr. Speaker. And the Honourable Member for Perry Sound, Muskoka. Mr. Speaker, after eight years of NDP Liberal borrowing and spending, this Prime Minister is just not worth the cost. Ninety percent of Canadian mortgages up for renewal in the next two years are at fixed interest rates of about three percent. Today, there are three million Canadians about to head to renew their mortgages, and they're facing rates of up to seven percent. The Bank of Canada Governor has confirmed that excessive government borrowing and spending is driving these rate hikes. So when will the Prime Minister end the inflationary spending, balance the budget to lower rates so that Canadians can afford to eat, heat and keep their homes? The Honourable Deputy Prime Minister. Mr. Speaker, I am glad that the member opposite has asked a question about mortgage renewals because it gives me an opportunity to be sure that all Canadians know about the Canadian Mortgage Charter, which we published in the Fall Economic Statement a couple of weeks ago. The Canadian Mortgage Charter gives Canadians who are facing a mortgage renewal a clear sense of what they have the right to ask their bank to do in terms of tailored support. It's providing Canadians with relief right now, and I urge everyone to take a look. The Honourable Member for Perry Sound, Muskoka. Well, I can bet that their mortgage charter and any other photo ops and PR stunts they do are about as useful as Monopoly money, but more liberal vanity projects and PR campaigns clearly aren't going to fix the fiscal mess that this liberal NDP government has caused over the last eight years. Canadians headed to renew their mortgages are facing double the payments. And they're about to find out that this Prime Minister is just not worth the cost. So when, I ask when, when will the NDP Liberal government stop the inflationary spending, balance the budget, lower rates, so that Canadians can afford to keep their homes? The Honourable Deputy Prime Minister and Minister of Finance. Mr. Speaker, as I think everyone in this House knows, Canada has a AAA rating and the lowest debt and deficit in the G7. It is also true, Mr. Speaker, that our government invested in Canadians during COVID, and we were proud to do so. We supported 9 million Canadians with CERB. We supported more than 5 million Canadian jobs with the wage subsidy, and we supported 900,000 Canadian businesses with SIBA loans. Mr. Speaker, the leader of the official opposition called those big, fat government programs. I call those life rafts for Canadians when they needed them the most. The Honourable Member for Costa Bay Central Notre Dame. Mr. Speaker, after eight years of this NDP-backed Liberal Prime Minister, the cost of homes and rent has doubled. Mr. Speaker, it's so bad in St. John's that one man ignored his bail hearing so that he could be sent to jail instead of spending a cold, wet, homeless winter on the streets. When petty criminals choose dilapidated jail cells like those at Her Majesty's Penitentiary over homelessness, it's clear that this Prime Minister is just not worth the cost. So will the Prime Minister commit to ending the homeless crisis, or does he take pleasure in seeing people choose jail over homelessness. The Honourable Minister of Housing. 
Mr. Speaker, I don't think any member of this House of any party takes any pleasure in seeing anyone in this country live on the street, and it would be a shame if the Honourable Member were suggesting that was the case. When it comes to the supports that we're actually putting place in the City of St. John's, which he referenced in his question, I would point him to the recent exchange we had with the Mayor of St. John's, where we encouraged them to increase their housing ambition so they could actually provide homes for more people and reduce the cost of rent. The funding that we hope to provide to the City of St. John's, should they meet the moment, comes through a program that he is personally committing to oppose. The Conservatives believe the solution to the housing crisis is to spend less money on housing, and I fundamentally disagree. The Honourable Member for Kelowna, Lake Country. Well, Mr. Speaker, inflation is caused by the Prime Minister's deficit spending. The Bank of Montreal's chief economist explained that inflation is the new villain, fueling the fires of Canada's housing hell. Rents have skyrocketed 8.2 per cent year over year, the fastest pace since 1983. Rents are up, mortgages are up, inflation's up, interest rates are up. This Prime Minister is just not worth the cost. After eight years, when will this NDP Liberal government stop their deficit spending so people can keep a, ho a, a, a roof over their head? Thank you. The Honourable Deputy Prime Minister. Mr. Speaker, let's talk about some facts and reality. The reality is Canada has the lowest deficit and the lowest debt to GDP ratio in the entire G7. The reality is that when you listen to the objective economists whose job is to judge our fiscal position, the ratings agencies, we have a AAA rating. And you know what, Mr. Speaker? We made the necessary investments to support Canadians. That's by 1.1 million more jobs in Canada than before COVID, why our economy is more than 104% bigger than it was before COVID, Mr. Speaker. The Honourable Member for rivière des Mille-Îles. Mr. Speaker, for months we have wanted to know who interfered in the competition for the Afghanistan Mission Monument, who overruled the jury to oust Quebec's Daou team. Well, documents obtained at committee confirm that the Prime Minister's office interfered in May 22, 2022. PMO organized a meeting with departments to discuss the competition. Then in July, PMO lobbied, but the officials were against the idea of bypassing the jury. Why did PMO interfere in the competition to make sure the Daou team lost? The Honourable Minister of Veterans Affairs. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Thanks very much. I'd like to thank my colleague for his important question. Mr. Speaker, the creation of the Afghanistan Monument will recognize the commitment of Canadians who served in that mission. Mr. Speaker, the Department of Veterans Affairs did a poll or a questionnaire, and over 12,000 Canadians, most of them veterans, responded to the poll. And the concept chosen was one that they felt better reflected their bravery and participation. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. The Honourable Member for rivière du Mr. Speaker, the survey they're talking about is bogus. Léger panned it. But in any case, the jury did take into account that poll before making their decision. Here's what really happened. PMO interfered with the decision at least twice. The Department of Justice provided legal opinions on the consequences of overturn overturning the jury's decision. Expert witness Jean-Pierre Chupin at committee confirmed that out of 500 competitions in Canada, this had never happened before. Why did the Prime Minister interfere in the competition to make sure the Dao team lost? The Honourable Minister of Veterans Affairs. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, what really happened was the government chose to listen to veterans. The department did a poll or a questionnaire and over 12,000 Canadians responded. And once again, Mr. Speaker, the vast majority of those respondents were veterans or their family members. The results were clear. People felt that the selected monument better reflected the bravery and participation of veterans, and that's why we went with that choice. Crowfoot. 
Canadians depend on affordable proteins like chicken, yet over the last eight years, families are forced to cut back on these essentials. Canadian farms lead the world in environmental be best practices, but the Liberals choose only to punish them with higher costs, red tape, and a quadrupling of the carbon tax. A chicken farmer near Redwater, Alberta, is already paying nearly two grand a month in the carbon tax. Come the middle of winter, that cost will double. Costs that are passed on to Canadians who are already struggling to put food on the table. Will these Liberals finally take the tax off families, farmers and First Nations finally? The Honourable Minister of Agriculture. Speaker, speaking with farmers uh, across the country, one of the biggest concerns they have is why the opposition party does not have a policy or a plan to deal with the environment. Chicken farmers understand very well, like every other farmer, you need to have a plan. We have to deal with the environment. And because we do have a plan for environment, we're able to assist chicken farmers. We're able to make sure the supply management system remains in safe. You can tell my honorable colleague, Mr. Speaker, and can tell his chicken farmer that we will make sure that supply management remains strong. The honorable member for Battle River Crowfoot. Mr. Speaker, it is unbelievable how out of touch that Ag Minister is. Jake from Vermeer's Dairy near Camrose is, is, saw a bill of $1,700 in carbon tax charges alone last month, and it's going to be more as winter settles in on the Canadian prairies. Mr. Speaker, it is clear that these Liberals do not have an environmental plan, but rather a tax plan that punishes those who f are best equipped to lower the price of food in this country. Mr. Speaker, my question is simple. Will those Liberals tell their senator, uh, liberal appointed senators to pass common sense conservative bill C234 to axe the tax so farmers can feed our people. The Honourable Minister of Agriculture. I appreciate my honourable question, question and my office has been in regular contact with the families you spoke about. The operation has benefited from several of our government programs including the BRM program and funding through the Climate Action Incentive Fund. We will continue to support large operations in the country and we will continue to work with small agricultural operations in this country to make sure both operations succeed and expand. The Honourable Member for Portneuf Jacques Cartier. Mr. Speaker, can this government listen to common sense? They've been in power for eight years. Can't they get out of their bubble and pay attention to the real world? It's expensive to vote for the bloc. Here's another example. With bloc complicity, the Liberals are blocking Bill C-234, which would give a break to our farmers and, by the same token, Canadian families. Will the Prime Minister put an end to his plan to radically increase the carbon tax on the backs of our farmers and Canadian families, Mr. Speaker? The Honourable Parliamentary Secretary to the Minister of the Environment. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Unfortunately, it's important for me to say once again that there is no federal carbon tax in Quebec for farmers or for the public. Mr. Speaker, like all members in this place, I share the goal of ensuring our, our, the situation for our Canadian farmers, and that's why we have taken steps to help rural families uh, and we've returned $120 million to farmers since... Uh, ...for Richmond Centre. Mr. Speaker, housing is top of mind for my community of Richmond Centre and all Canadians. For many, the rising cost of rent is causing stress, and for others, they feel like they will never be able to own a home. On this side of the House, Mr. Speaker, we have a plan to address those concerns and get more homes built. Can the Honourable Deputy Prime Minister and Minister of Finance tell Canadians what our government has been doing to build more homes faster for British Columbians? Uh, the Honourable Minister, Minister of Finance. Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, I'd like to start by thanking the member for his important question and for his hard work for the people of Richmond Centre and all the people of BC. 
Our government is stepping up to lead the national effort to build more homes faster. Just last week, I was at an affordable housing project in downtown Vancouver. That project next May will begin welcoming its first residents into 231 beautiful new affordable rental homes. And that is less than three years after shovels first went into the ground. We're going to keep on working to build more homes faster for Canadians, Mr. Speaker. The Honourable Member for South Shore St. Margaret's. After eight years, the NDP Liberal government has turned their backs on Canadian labour. The government is bringing in 1,600 taxpayer-funded foreign replacement workers for the battery assembly plant in Windsor. That's $40 billion or $3,000 in taxes per household. Conservatives have been consistently demanding the release of these contracts publicly, but the NDP have flip-flopped and are working with the Liberals to keep the contracts secret, to hide these bad contracts. When will the Liberals and the NDP stand up for Canadian auto workers and release the contracts? The Honourable Parliamentary Secretary. Mr. Speaker, now either the Conservative leader takes us all for fools or he thinks the Canadian public was in a coma for the last 20 years. Either way, no one could take his claim to be protecting local jobs seriously. Not only is his track record as part of the previous Conservative government abysmal, consisting of the loss of over 300,000 manufacturing jobs, he has also proven to be one of the most anti-worker MPs, a legacy which he continues today by demonstrating and opposing legislation that creates good jobs for Canadian workers. While Conservatives pretend to care about workers, we'll continue to create thousands of jobs. The Honourable Member for Leeds, Grenville, Thousand Islands, Rita Lakes. The NDP have turned their back on Canadian workers to back this Prime Minister and his yep. secret deal to bring in overseas replacement <laughs> workers. It's clear that after eight years, this Prime Minister isn't worth the cost to Canadian workers. The NDP member for Windsor voted to keep secret the contracts from Canadian taxpayers. So if the NDP Liberal government have nothing to hide, then why not show Canadians the details that's going to cost them $3,000 per family? So will the Prime Minister finally release the contract details so Canadians can see how many replacement workers $40 billion buys? The Honourable Parliamentary Secretary to the Minister of Innovation. Contrary to what the Conservatives claim, our government has always been clear regarding jobs created by investments like like LG Stellantis. In a recent article, Yakubuski writes, these workers will only be here for a matter of months. The plant could not be built without them, or at least not in time for battery production to be up and running by 2025. They will not steal jobs from Canadian construction workers, nor occupy any of the 2,500 permanent jobs. Now, I know the opposition leader has a hard time showing respect to journalists, but maybe the Conservatives should stop fear-mongering and read the globe and mail. We were doing so well right to about there. There we go. The honorable member for Montmagny, Lillet, Kamaraska, Rivière du Loup. Mr. Speaker, after eight years of this government, we all know that cover-ups have become their trademark. At the Government Operations Committee, the Liberals filibustered for hours to avoid disclosing the contracts with the battery plants. And we know what, what they're afraid of. From Stellantis in Ontario to North Volt in Quebec, this Prime Minister has poured billions into temporary replacement workers. He's just not worth the cost. Will he finally set the record straight for Canadians and make the contracts public? The Honourable Government House Leader. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. As my Honourable colleague knows full well, committees are independent. They make their own decisions. But when it comes to investing in Stellantis, the Conservatives... It we're in favor because that's 250,000 jobs in Windsor. And what the local union head says is that what the Conservatives are doing is actually jeopardizing these investments. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. The Honourable Member for Calgary Skyview. 
Mr. Speaker, last week Dow Chemicals announced a multi-billion dollar investment in Alberta. While the Conservative members from Alberta voted against the policies that helped us land this job-creating deal, Liberals still made it happen. If they were in power... Order. Yelling there. Let's just keep the volume down so the honourable member can ask the question. The honourable member of Calgary Skyview. If they were in power, the climate science denying Conservatives would squander these investments with their alternative facts based agenda. Can the Minister of Energy and Natural Resources update this House on how my home? Okay. The Honourable Minister. <laughs> thank you, Mr. Speaker. I would like to uh, thank my colleague for his consistent advocacy for Alberta and Albertans. Mr. Speaker, any relevant and credible plan... Turn my own microphone on here. Order. Order. I thought we were doing really well. We went really quickly here through these questions. It's been awesome up to now. Uh, the Honourable Minister of Natural Resources from the top. I would like to once again thank my Honourable colleague for his consistent advocacy for Alberta and Yay! Alberta. Mr. Speaker, any relevant, credible plan must take climate change seriously and look to seize the economic opportunities that can come through a transition to a low-carbon future. Last week, Dow announced it was taking advantage of Canada's carbon capture hydrogen investment tax credit to build the world's first net-zero petrochemical facility. It is an $11 billion investment, create 8,000 jobs in construction and hundreds thereafter for Port Saskatchewan. But it's not just the credits that motivated Dow, and I quote the Dow CEO who said they invested here because, and I quote, Canada has a price on carbon and pollution. While Conservatives have no plan, they don't have a plan for the environment, they don't have a plan for the economy, our plan is work. The Honourable Member for Port Moody, Coquitlam. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. People with disabilities are being renovicted and priced out of their homes. Disproportionately, it's women also at risk of gender violence. Over half of women with disabilities are living on less than $10,000 a year. This is not sustainable or safe. The skyrocketing cost of housing and food is hurting persons with disabilities. They need the Canada Disability Benefit yesterday. Will this Liberal, gov liberal government end their unnecessary delay and release the Canada Disability Benefit immediately? Here, here. The Honourable Parliamentary Secretary to the Minister of Diversity and Inclusion. Mr. Speaker, I'd like to thank the member opposite for her advocacy and for raising the issue of disability. This is a very important concern. Our government is seized by this issue. Yep. Thankfully, our parliament, this parliament, passed the disability benefit, made it into law. We are working on the regulations. We are consulting the community fully, and this will happen. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. The Honourable Member for Spadina, Fort York. Mr. Speaker, only two months till a long-awaited inquiry into foreign interference. Sadly, foreign operatives even remotely involved are retired and back in Beijing or Tehran. The Hogue inquiry faces serious time constraints issuing an interim report in February and a final report by the end of 2024. It took two months to create a website and harder to find than interference itself. It strains credulity that the inquiry will be in full force with Santa and New Year's. Aside from its desire for this thorny issue to disappear, does the government find it odd that Canadians can get more information on foreign interference in Canada simply by reading the New York Times? The Honourable Parliamentary Secretary. Speaker, as I've said before in this place, we take the issues of foreign interference extremely seriously. We've moved forward with consultations on a foreign agent registry. We've implemented several measures in this place to strengthen our democratic institutions. And Mr. Speaker, we look forward to the Hogue recommendations that we will also be looking at very seriously. Mr. Speaker, this is a, not a partisan issue, but an issue that every single parliamentarian should be taking seriously and we look forward to working with everyone in this place and that's all the time we have for question period today